We have seen an uptick in crimes of hate in the city. White supremacist groups operating inside San Francisco. The city's DA says they're organized and dangerous. El primer golpe yo lo sentí que me pegó y me pegué en la pared y uh... We are fully committed to prosecuting this case. You have to be able to stand up for what is right. It didn't feel like just an attack on me, it felt an attack on all of us. On behalf of our town, on behalf of the city of San Francisco, I ask you for justice. skinheads, Anthony Weston and Justin Meskin, and a Nazi sympathizer, Richard Trich, and a wannabe, Mr. Robert Allen, go to a bar. I want to be clear about this. There's no fight. There's no drunken brawl. What happens on the night of November 9th is a one-sided, racially motivated attack on two hardworking Mayan dishwashers who just happened to be in that area. No he hecho nada sin tener problemas. Yo no conozco a nadie allá. El primer golpe yo lo sentí que me pegó y me pegué en la pared y ya. I remember watching them punch and kick him and he wasn't moving. And then I just saw him being repeatedly kicked in the face. I mean, I've seen fights, but I'd never seen anything like this. During the course of this assault, which lasted four traffic lights long in the middle of the street, that they heard phrases being yelled by all the men. He yelled. Once you run across the street, you fucking spicks like you run across the border. And like celebrating San Francisco white power. Just st stuff you don't hear in San Francisco at all. The vast majority of hate crimes are never reported to the police. Y yo pensaba que no, ya he hecho, ya violé la ley, ya no tengo derechos acá. Yo no creía que puedo ganar un caso como este. My name is Victor Huang. I am the hate crimes DA for San Francisco District Attorney's Office. A lot of DAs and police are reluctant to prosecute cases of hate crimes. They're harder to prove. On top of proving the intent and the act, you have to prove the motive, which is a little bit different than what you have to do for any other type of crime. They were stopped, they were kicked, the case right now involves an assault by three to five suspected skinheads against two Latinos in the Tenderloin. Nobody honked. Nobody stopped anything. It took a while and for like some random girl came out, came out the bar and like laid over him, tried to help him. I heard the white male say, what are you doing? He's like, you're white. He's just a spick, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. You're white, you're white, you shouldn't be doing this. And then the cops came. There was some pretty good police work initially to interview the witnesses in the area. And we've eventually arrested three suspected skinheads. And what is it that caught your attention? It was a photograph that was taped onto the wall in the hallway. And can you describe for us this photograph? Uh, it's Richard Treach basically saluting a flag with a swastika on it. As we approached trial, one of the defendants involved in the attack became a witness for us, and he also provided intelligence on the skinhead network operating in San Francisco. We know now, we got established evidence that we have active white supremacist groups operating within our city and county, and that we're all gonna have to work together to make sure that that type of activity is not tolerated in our county. Immigrant communities are very reluctant to approach law enforcement. 
they feel that there will be retaliation if they do report incidents to the police. There are frequently language barriers. They may see the hate, but they're not able to express it in a way or repeat the same words and identify them as hate crimes. I went to law school to serve the community and do civil rights work. I worked for almost five years as a public defender. I worked for 11 years representing victims of crime, and hate crime in particular, on civil side issues. Seeing the trauma that's sort of inflicted on victims when charges are not brought, when it's not recognized what happened to them. After a while, I just thought it's better to join and uh, take over the, the prosecution of these cases. I do remember when, when I met Alex, Alex was severely uh, affected uh, at the beginning. He didn't even want to talk about what happened to him. He was very afraid. Uh, it was a case that took a while until he came to testify. Because no puedo ni hablar. Lo que único hago es llorar. Y lo que me duele lo que me pasado. He was assisted by therapists and psychiatrists that, that helped him. He was able to uh, uh, who come forward, uh, report the crime with his cousin and definitely a very strong individual. A challenge we face every day in working with our victims is trying to get them to come to court and, and participate in the prosecution. We want them to know that this is a high priority for us. I'm willing to charge the case, even if it's a tough case, it's an uphill case for us at trial. I finish by asking you, on behalf of Alex and Omar, on behalf of our town, on behalf of the city of San Francisco, for justicia, I ask you for justice for Alex and Omar. Thank you. There was a uh, report of an African-American panhandler that was in this square and he was intoxicated and he was just kind of roaming around asking people for change. And then he approached the defendant, Matthew Swan, and Matthew Swan appeared to make a very quick motion. He pulled out the silver blade and then he slashed the victim across the face. The blood sort of spurted out and he dropped on a spot commemorating the African-American leadership in the neighborhood. The case wasn't initially charged as a hate crime. There weren't any words exchanged that anybody could hear, so there wasn't any racial slurs or anything like that. Matthew Swan actually made his escape and got away. The uh, officers in this case did a very thorough investigation. They went, they got stills from the Safeway. They showed the stills to everybody in the neighborhood, and they ended up identifying him and then going and searching his apartment. And that's when they saw the Nazi switchblade, they saw a lot of skinhead literature scattered through the apartment. That's when we started looking at the case as a hate crime. A few days later, I was at the ER room at San Francisco General Hospital, and I ran into the ER nurse, and she just said, in 20 years of working there, she had never seen somebody take a stand for a homeless person. And she says, I see these people day and night being assaulted, Nobody ever prosecutes their cases because they're not clean victims. It's hard to tell what a motive is in an individual assault. To do that, we really, it requires a more extensive investigation into the person's background, who they associate with, what kind of literature they're reading, what websites they're visiting, the, the overall motivation for why they're doing what they're doing. A few years prior to this slashing, he had been arrested at Union Square with a Sharpie marker drawing swastikas and putting up Nazi slogans, declaring that he was a skinhead soldier. It wasn't until we researched his entire history, looked at the vandalism in his past, looked at the other arrests, that we were able to build our case for motive. The defendant was convicted of a felony assault with a deadly weapon. Um, also with inflicting the great bodily injury on the victim, and he was eventually sentenced to 12 years in state prison for what he did. We wanted to send a very clear message that we would not tolerate 
their behavior here in the city and that we would aggressively prosecute them. I grew up in a very small town in Texas. You know, it was horrible going to school and I would get harassed every day, all the time. My school wasn't safe. My church community was telling me that I was going to hell and that there was no space for me. Hate crimes are message-oriented crimes because they have a greater impact than the violence upon a particular individual. In Mia's case, she was at the 16th admission BART stop so she was minding her business. Two young men came up to her, and they were very attracted to her. They started making very flirtatious comments. As they got closer, they realized that she was a birth male, and as she describes it, things got ugly. I knew that he was harassing me because he could tell that I was trans. I started to get you know, scared at that point. They immediately turned on her. They said things like, that's a man, not a woman. We hate men who dress like women. And she tried to just ignore them, and so she started texting a friend. They grabbed the phone out of her hands, and as she stood up and, and begged for her phone back, one of them just punched her with full force in the face, knocking her down to the ground. I remember laying on the ground in the fetal position after being attacked and really just feeling like, this is it. This is how a trans woman dies. I just felt an enormous sadness of feeling like the cultural like weight and pain of like this entire community because you're not beating me up because you're bored. You're beating me up because you hate men in dresses, as you call it, and because I challenge your notions of like what it means to be a woman um, and what it means to be a man. So she stood up and she um, didn't just cry for help, but started giving directions to the folks in the neighborhood. She pointed them out and said, that's the man who hit me. Somebody call the police. We had a lot of witnesses who had rushed up in the meantime who had heard all of these anti-transgender comments. So, Victor, what are the cases you're working on? Uh, lately, I've been working with the mystery energy, actually. So I took it back to our office. DA George Gascon made the decision to refile all of the hate crime charges. And after we filed it, we were able to negotiate a plea uh, where both of them admitted they did it for hate crime reasons. I was glad to see that Victor Wong um, challenged that and said, no, it's important for us to call this what it is, hate. For the 15 or so years I've monitored hate crimes in San Francisco, I've never seen this level of organized skinhead activity. That's pretty rare and signifies to us that there is something going on. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, counsel. We will now hear some arguments from the defense. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. The district attorney is saying that Robert Allen is a racist who committed a violent act because he, in whole or in part, has it out for little brown people. I think the whole thing was overblown from the beginning, including the, the uh, press releases and everything else. This is the sort of thing that happens all the time, uh, particularly in, in depressed neighborhoods like the Tenderloin or Sixth Street. And to call it a hate crime when it's obviously just stupidity, I think was was blowing it way out of proportion. Can the clerk please call the jury? Yeah. Okay. Juror number one, Johansson. 
Jury number two. Your answer. Jury. But the jury found the defendants guilty of the assault, although we did not get the hate allegations that we would have preferred to get in the case. In some ways, the case was a victory. We got a successful prosecution on a assault with great bodily injury. They were sent to state prison for longer periods of time than we had asked for. On the other hand, I think it was bittersweet because the jury did not convict on the hate crime allegation. So the jurors were sort of split as a matter of law. What they said is that everybody agrees that race was a component of this, that this guy would have not been beaten so badly but for the fact that he was Mexican. But we couldn't say for sure. We were split as to whether or not it's what started the fight. They, these guys didn't go out there looking to kill a Mexican or beat up a Mexican. But we all know that race played a major role in the brutality of the beating. Even when you prosecute this case with a very experienced prosecutor, with a case that is really clearly showing that race was a motivating factor in the assaults, and yet we still didn't get a conviction for that piece. Me siento feliz que yo ya tuve la oportunidad y ya lo, ya lo, ya lo gané y ve que no es como decir que es una, una victoria porque tampoco, pero hacemos valer nuestros derechos y solo venimos acá a, a trabajar y no puede ser por causa que, que nos maltraten. What I remember about Alex's testimony was that he was a, a very strong victim, somebody who had um, to me is really the embodiment of the American dream. And I hope that his experience coming to court, knowing that somebody would step up to protect him, and that the American system would convict those who had done this to him, I hope that validated his faith in our system of justice. A lot of vulnerable victims are not going to come to the Hall of Justice. They're not gonna to come to a police station to report crimes. So what we did is we started to put many of our victim advocates out into the community. People will feel comfortable going to a community center or a YMCA. I'm really honored to be here today. And in order to prevent crime, you have to get out there. You have to talk, you have to discuss the issues, you have to understand what's going on in the community. Unless we get people to come forward and really report these crimes, it is often difficult to come up with what kind of services we're going to pay for, how much police we're going to put to the problem. You have to tell somebody that this happened and you can't do it alone and that you shouldn't be afraid to reach out for help. After this incident, she organized her own rally at 16th and Mission at the BART station. You know, when I turned the corner and I saw this really big unity sign, uh, I just got really emotional because there was hundreds of people. No more violence! No more violence! It was really cool to see strangers stand up for me. I want you to join with me, which you already are because you're here. to change the conditions that allow for hatred and violence to thrive in this city. Falta que nosotros quitamos el miedo y dar la cara frente del del que nos maltrata o por por racismo. The one positive message I can give you is that you have a law enforcement team here that is really dedicated to this work. It's not just sort of our day job. If it gets to us and it's a hate crime, every hate crime in the city will be aggressively prosecuted. Being a district attorney, it's not an easy job. And it's one that is always full of controversy. But at the end of the day, we are the people that are out there to protect the victims. And protecting the victim is much more than simply prosecuting a case and getting a conviction. You have to be able to stand up for what is right.